This is John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday I want to talk about rifle scopes. Not any one particular rifle scope, but rifle scopes in general and the features that you need to be looking for when you're trying to select a rifle scope. Now there are a lot of things that end up being uh, just end user preference on rifle scopes, but there are a couple of key features that you really need to keep in mind if you're trying to select a rifle scope uh, specifically for long range precision shooting or for precision rifle competition shooting. Uh, there are a couple of features that uh, over many competitions and several years of doing this, uh, generally most shooters will look for and most shooters will find useful. Now the rifle scope sitting in front of me is the Bushnell XRS 4.5 to 30 power and it has a 56 millimeter objective. Uh, this rifle scope, uh, Precision Rifle Blog did a uh, little piece not too long ago about the top rifle scopes in Precision Rifle Competition or Precision Rifle Series and I believe this one came in fourth. Um, it is a rifle scope that you will see very often in any of the big PRS matches. Uh, it is a great balance between price and features. Uh, it doesn't have the best glass out there. Uh, the tracking is repeatable. Uh, when you dial a mill on the scope, uh, a mill is pretty much what you get in real life. So those things are great. They're fairly durable scopes, uh, but they can be a little bit finicky to get the uh, zero stops dialed in and get them set up. Once you get it set up for the rifle, it's generally good to go. Now, again, this uh, piece isn't specifically on this scope, but since this has most of the features that you would want as a precision rifle series shooter, I figures that's what I will cover here. Now, the first thing, let's talk about the power range on this scope. Uh, this has a four and a half power on the low end, which you will almost never use. Uh, and it has a 30 power on the top end, which you will very rarely use. Uh, now, power again comes down to an individual shooter preference. I tend to like a little bit more magnification. Some other shooters use considerably less. But when we have uh, multiple targets set up on a stage at varying distances and they are spread out laterally pretty well, then you really want to run that stage with a lower power setting on your scope. And I will find myself somewhere in the 15 to 10 power. Uh, 15 if I'm stretching out a little bit and they're really closer together laterally. Uh, 10 power if they're really wide out and I'm really going to be swinging a lot back and forth uh, between different targets. Um, 4.5 to 30 is going to cover just about anything that you could conceivably need in a precision rifle match going out to 1300 yards or so. Uh, you could even use the scope on an extreme long range rig where you're reaching out further. That 30 power will give you a little bit of benefit, but again, uh, the glass is not absolutely perfect in the scope. There are scopes that have uh, better resolution in their glass at the top end magnifications. So the sight picture, you do lose a little bit when you get up into that 30 power. So you need to keep that in mind when you're looking at a scope. Is the glass on it absolutely crystal clear? Are you going to be able to use that top end magnification? Most of the time, this scope will be shot in the 10 to 15 power range. So the large objective just gives you a little bit brighter sight picture in that range. You don't necessarily need this big Mongo objective. So let's talk about objectives now. Um, in the scope arms race, it seems that everybody keeps bumping up the objective size. You know, first we were running 40 millimeter objectives, 44 millimeter objectives, 50, and you know, now we're up to big uh, Mongo 56. 50 and 56 seems to be about the average. Um, what this does for you, there, you'll hear people talk about gathering light. Scopes don't actually gather light. Scopes are passive devices. Uh, they transmit light. Whatever light actually comes in through the front here uh, is transmitted through different optical elements. Now there are a lot of things 
that affect how bright that sight picture is to your eye. Uh, how many lenses are in here, what the glass is that the lenses are composed of, what coatings are on the lenses. Uh, but everybody seems to drop back to that whole objective lens diameter. Objective lens diameter is one of the things that factor it in. Obviously, a larger objective lens will be able to pass more light through that first layer of glass than a smaller objective lens. Uh, so if it's a scope that you're going to use in a lot of low light conditions, uh, then a larger objective may suit you better if everything else inside the scope is equal, and it generally is not. Uh, you'll see some really, really cheap scopes that have massive objective lenses because they're trying to compensate for poor coatings and poor glass quality back through the rest of the rifle scope. Uh, so if you are losing light, quite quickly when you go through those elements in the scope, uh, you definitely want to have as much coming through that front as you possibly can. Um, I shoot rifle competitions with a varying uh, array of objective diameters. Uh, 44 millimeters, I think right now, as far as my competition scopes, 44 millimeters is the smallest, and that's on a uh, US Optics SN3, and that's just fine. Uh, it's an adjust, adjustable objective scope, so uh, the it has a ring up front around the objective to adjust your parallax, and that kind of necessitates a, a slightly smaller objective lens. Uh, but I've never gotten on that scope and had issues seeing targets in a PRS match. Uh, I also have not had any real issues with it in... Uh, low light scenarios compared to a lot of other rifle scopes and that's because US Optics uses fairly high quality glass and some pretty decent coatings. Uh, so that scope transmits light through fairly well. So don't get hung up on needing a massive objective on your scope. Uh, large objectives actually start to cause you some issues with having to raise that rifle scope up higher and higher to get the objective to clear the rail if you've got a one-piece top rail like this chassis does here, or if you are running a large diameter barrel. And if you're running a large diameter barrel in a traditional rifle stock, uh, now you're gonna have to do something to build that comb up to get your face back to where you need to be to get your eyeball behind the objective of the scope. So as far as magnification and objective diameter, um, that's what we are looking at. Don't get hung up on the objective diameter. Worry about the quality of the glass in the scope. And don't get crazy power hungry on the magnification. Any, any scope that goes up to 20, 21 power or somewhere in there uh, is going to have sufficient top end magnification. Uh, on the low end, you want to make sure that you can go down to at least 5 power. Uh, four and a half really isn't going to make a big difference between five, but uh, if they get into a situation where they throw a really close range stage at you, uh, you're going to need to back that magnification down in order to be able to focus on those closer range targets and get your parallax dialed in. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now let's talk about tube diameter. Um, tube diameter is another point in the scope arms race that has kept going up and up and up. Uh, back in the day, we had one-inch diameter tubes, and a one-inch diameter tube still had enough room for the internals of that scope to travel uh, to be able to adjust and get hits at 1,000 yards with a 308. Um, this goes back to the old uh, Unertl 10X. Uh, there are a lot of 3-9 to nine power scopes out there uh, with small diameter bodies, uh, main tubes, that you can still get a decent amount of elevation dialed in. Uh, one of the things I think of they started going to these larger tubes is they just look beefier. Obviously, a larger tube, if the wall diameter is the same, is going to give you a little bit more strength than a smaller diameter tube. Um, and it just, what it really boils down to is these larger diameter tubes, you want to make sure that you're staying with something that gives you a lot of mounting options. Uh, you don't need to go with a 35 or a 34 millimeter tube. You're not really getting any performance gain on it. Uh, 30 millimeter tubes are more than sufficient for what we do. But should you choose to go with a 34 or 35 millimeter scope, uh, make sure that you can get the mounting system that you need for that main tube before you drop down the cost on that scope. 
Uh, there are a variety of systems out here now for both uh, 34 and 35 millimeter, uh, but just make sure you do your research uh, to be able to get the mounting system that you need for that scope. Let's touch on parallax adjustment real quick. Uh, this scope has the parallax adjustment turret on the left-hand side of the scope. You obviously definitely want an adjustable parallax scope, uh, because you are going to be able to dial that parallax out. And uh, real quickly, for those of you that may not understand what parallax is, a lot of people will talk about parallax like it's just focus. Uh, parallax is not exactly focus. Uh, what parallax is is a difference in the focal plane between the reticle and the target. Uh, what you can do if you have parallax... Uh, you can move your eyeball slightly around behind the objective of the scope and the reticle will appear to float on the target. So the center of your crosshairs will cover different portions of the target depending upon where your eyeball is at. Obviously, if we are trying to place a bullet very precisely on the target, that's not a good thing. So as you dial your parallax and you move that eyeball around, you should see those crosshairs, the wobble area in them, get smaller and smaller until they're actually pinned to the target. Now your sight picture is parallax free. You've adjusted it down to where the reticle and the target image are on the same plane and now they're stuck together and what you see is what you get. When you press the trigger, hopefully if you've done everything right, your bullet is going to impact where the center of those crosshairs are. So adjustable parallax is really a good option to have. Uh, the old school 10 power scopes, uh, they would have a parallax adjustment that you could set or one that was set at the factory for 100, 200 yards, somewhere in there. And then you, for your time out on the range, you left it alone. The only time you would set the parallax would generally be when you zeroed the rifle and then that was it. Or like some of the old uh, school hunting scopes. Uh, they were set at the factory, and the user really couldn't adjust them without causing some issues, purging the, the uh, nitrogen out of the scope, that kind of stuff. So now almost all of our scopes have an adjustable objective or an adjustable parallax feature on the outside of the scope. Now where that control is, uh, is uh, going to vary depending upon the scope. As I said, this one is on the left-hand side. Uh, the Collis K624i that we just reviewed, uh, it has it just underneath the elevation turret, so it's pretty much ambidextrous. You can reach it from either side. Some of the older scopes, like my US Optics SN3, has an adjustable objective, uh, so it has a ring around the objective that allows you to adjust that parallax. Where the control is really does not make as much of a difference as you knowing how to get it, being able to get at it from varying different positions, and being able to get it dialed in to where you want it quickly. Uh, the adjustable objectives, I find that with an adjustable objective, you have to adjust it less. It's really more forgiving. You have a deeper field of view uh, or a deeper focus. Uh, with the adjustable objective, but it also causes some problems if you use regular flip-up scope caps. Uh, you have that hinge on a flip-up scope cap, and when you try to roll that obje adjustable objective around, that hinge can hit your rail if you've got it mounted low. Uh, the scope cap, when it's flipped open, it can run into the forearm. Uh, it just There are a very different array of problems with the adjustable objectives. If you run one, a lot of times it's just easier to pop the scope cap off completely or run bikini scope caps that you're taking off and not having to worry about it. Uh, what I do, I'll generally still run flip-up caps, but I will clock the caps so that I have a free range of adjustment uh, through where I will generally need it. I rarely ever need to go below a hundred yards on my parallax on a competition rifle. So I'll clock it to where the scope cap is against the forearm on one side at 100, and that gives me the largest range to go up uh, before it hits on the other side. 
And parallax is kind of funny. If you say you're going to shoot a range of targets, you're, you've got one at 250, one at 300, one at 350. Well, you can dial the parallax in for 250 and you're going to be fine. You don't have to readjust the parallax for each one. Uh, if I was shooting a group for score at 500 yards, well, I don't want to have my parallax set at 400. I'm going to go ahead and dial it in at 500. And I'm not just going to go with the numbers on the side of the parallax adjustment, I am going to actually look through the scope and move my eyeball around and make sure I get that parallax dialed out. Um, the numbers thing brings us to another point. Don't just believe the numbers on your parallax adjustment. Uh, some of them will be marked for yardages. Uh, some of them will not be. Some of them will just, like this scope, have little dots or uh, little lines or uh, varying different markings to tell you if you're going up or going down. Um, I do prefer to actually have numbers marked on there, and the reason being, if I have a stage where I have to jump in quickly and do something, uh, then I don't want to futz around with the parallax. I want to slap it into a setting that I know is going to be really close uh, and then go. But uh, the caveat to that is that I have already taken that scope out previously and made sure that those numbers correspond pretty closely uh, to the actual parallax settings at those various ranges. So that's enough on parallax. Um, now let's talk about turrets. Uh, turret styles and designs are probably one of the biggest differences between the various rifle scopes that are out there right now. Uh, each company tries to come up with a slightly different turret design uh, to differentiate them from their competition. Uh, when you look across all the different shapes and all the different features, uh, there are really two features that I like to have on a rifle scope. One I consider mandatory, uh, the other I consider a luxury to have. Uh, the luxury is locking turrets. Uh, this scope right now, while the turret is pushed down, uh, there is no way to turn it, either the elevation or the windage turret. They are absolutely locked in. So if I was an operational sniper and this was in a drag bag or strapped to my pack or even cradled in my arms, being drug across my tack gear, drug through brush, etc., uh, these turrets are not going to turn. They're going to stay dialed in exactly where they're at. Uh, now, when I want to make an adjustment, I do have to pull up on the turret, and then, of course, I'm able to dial it to make an adjustment, and then I can lock it back down. This is a really nice feature because the turret is where you left it. Uh, you don't have to worry about it getting dialed off, so if you are one of these guys that like to dial and hold, dial for your closest target and then hold for further on targets, and you're on a stage where you're jumping from barricade to barricade or obstacle to obstacle, then you can dial in your dope, you can lock it down, and it's going to stay where it's at. Even if you rub it across a barricade, even if you jam it into something, uh, you don't have to worry about these turning. Uh, same thing, if you set the scope on zero, you pretty much know it's on zero. If you look up and you see your turret up, uh, then you know you need to deal with it. But if it's locked down, you can pretty much be sure that it is where you left it at. Uh, with the Bushnell here, uh, these turrets are huge. Uh, they're really easy to get a hold of uh, when they're up. Uh, they still have a really good deal of uh, tension on them to bump through the clicks. So you can, when you're shooting a stage, if you need to dial for a stage, you can leave them up and leave it unlocked and you can dial freely to get through targets quickly and then just push it down when you're done. And with this one, you can see there's a little bit of lash. You just wiggle it a little bit and it locks all the way down. Uh, same thing with our windage over here. Um, that is a nice feature. A lot of scopes implement this, some in different manners. Uh, the pull push is probably the most common. Uh, some have a twist lock or something of that nature. I like the pull push because it's intuitive to pull it up to dial where you need and push it down to lock it in. Um, some of the other designs that are out there that have uh, either a locking lever or a dial or something to screw down, uh, those are not as intuitive and they can cause some problems. The one feature that I consider almost mandatory on at least your elevation turret is a zero stop. Um, it does not have to be a zero stop design that has you stopped on absolute zero. In fact, I don't want one that will have me on absolute zero. I want to have at least a 
half to a full mil below my zero in case I run into a situation where I notice my rifle is consistently hitting high and I want to be able to dial it down. Uh, I don't want to actually be locked in to a zero and always have to hold to compensate if I find either the rifle got jarred or uh, I didn't compensate for some temperatures or something's going on that's causing the rifle to impact off and I need to make a correction. Uh, but I want a hard stop somewhere on that elevation. That way, if I get lost in a revolution, uh, say I forgot to cancel out my dope, forgot to dial it back to zero when I came off of a stage, I'm not sure where my turret's at. Am I on the first turn? Am I on the second turn? A zero stop allows me just to crank it down till I hit the stop, then come back to zero, and I'm good to go. Um, there are various different implementations to that. Uh, this one here, the Bushnell XRS, probably has one of the most complex methods uh, to set the zero stop. Uh, the Collis K624i that we just reviewed probably has the simplest. Uh, you just loosen the turrets, slip it back to zero. When you set it back to zero, uh, the zero stop has automatically been set just slightly below zero. Uh, the disadvantage with the K624i is you are locked in to what the manufacturer set as your buffer below zero. Uh, you don't, there's not really any easy way that I've seen to adjust that. Uh, so while I like to go up to a mil below zero, uh, that one I believe I was locked into like three tenths or four tenths below zero, which is doable, uh, but still not my ideal. Then you have other scopes like the EREC turret on the US Optics. Uh, depending upon what your setup is, what your rifle setup is, uh, you may not have that hard stop right at zero or just below zero. Uh, it may be you know, three or four mils below zero uh, before you get to that hard stop. Uh, their turret system is slightly different. It's a little bit easier to adjust, but I don't think you have as precise control over that kind of stuff as some of the other optics out there like the uh, Night Force Beast or ATAC R or uh, some of those scopes where you can set the zero exactly where you want it to be. This one, you can set your uh, stop exactly where you want it to be, but it's a little bit of a pain to get it there. So those are the really the main features that I look for on the turrets. I like a zero stop, and I prefer some kind of locking system on the turrets. Uh, as far as turret markings, uh, they just need to be bold enough that I can see them quickly. Uh, the elevation turret... Uh, there's not a whole lot of different stuff marked on there. I like to have the primary rotation marked really bold. So like for instance, on this one, we've got 10 mils of uh, elevation on the first rev. So one through 10, I wanna be marked, or at least one through nine and zero, I wanna be marked really boldly. And then if a manufacturer decides to put the second rotation, the second revolution markings on there, I want those to be a little bit smaller, a little bit less bold than the first ones. Um, I don't really even care if the second rev markings are on there. I know uh, when I hit zero that one is gonna give me 11, two is gonna give me 12, you know, et cetera, with this scope. Uh, if you have a scope that does something like eight mils per rev or something strange, uh, then those second mil or second rev markings are a little bit more important because they prevent you from having to do uh, some odd math while you're trying to get shots off quickly. So that's something to think about. Now, five mil or 10 mil rev or 20 mil rev, um, that really doesn't make a difference to me. What I care about on the turrets is I want a distinct click uh, when I turn the turret. I want to be able to, if I want three clicks, I want to be able to hit three clicks right off the bat without even looking at the scope. I don't want to have to look up and see what the numbers are. And I don't want to have the clicks so close together uh, that it's like a buzz saw as I'm turning the turret. I would rather have a five mil per rev turret that has distinct clicks that are well separated uh, than a 10 mil per rev turret that has really short, small clicks that are packed close together. Uh, that's my personal preference. There may be other guys out there that really don't care, but I like the really distinct uh, clicks. 
like for instance the Vortex Razor uh, Gen 1, the 5 to 20 power scope, with the original 5 mil per rev turrets, there is a really nice distinct click, and you actually, <coughs> excuse me, you actually have to move the turret a little bit before you get those clicks. So it's a really, really nice feel on the clicks on that turret. Um, some of the other ones out there, they'll, it'll be a distinct click, even an audible click, but it just really is a weak feeling click and it's easy to scoot past it and get two clicks when you wanted one. So um, that's about it for the elevation turret. Now on the windage turret, uh, kind of the same thing on the clicks. I don't dial my windage a whole lot, so the click quality on the windage turret uh, is not as big a deal, but usually the clicks between windage and elevation will feel very much uh, the same on a single brand of rifle scopes. At least that, that's what I've seen. Uh, what I look for on the windage turret, um, besides preferably some kind of locking feature or a cover that screws on over the turret, I like when scope manufacturers will mark the center mark as a zero, and then going up, they'll mark 1L, 2L, 3L, and going down, they'll mark 1R, 2R, 3R, etc., uh, until they get to the other side, and then, of course, they usually have a center mark again. Um, I like that because it's really quick for me to look at the face of the turret, the markings on the turret, and know which direction I'm going and get my uh, adjustment dialed in. Uh, a lot of places they'll mark it on the outside of the turret, and they'll mark the rotation direction and left or right. Um, I don't dial windage a lot, so when I need to dial windage or I need to dial a lead in or something of that nature, I don't want to have to stop and think, do I need to go clockwise or counterclockwise? I don't like it when they just do one through whatever uh, without a left or right marking. So again, that's a personal preference. Uh, we don't dial wind a lot. Uh, usually when I do anything with the windage turret, I'm setting up before I'm starting a stage. Uh, so it's I'm not messing with the windage turret while I'm on the clock. So that's that's about it for the windage turret. Uh, zero adjustment. Uh, the last thing on turrets I'll talk about is how you slip the turrets back to zero. Uh, with the Bushnell, you have this big center screw that has a great big coin slot in it. Uh, this is probably one of the best ways that I've seen to get your turrets slipped back to zero. Uh, you can do it quickly out in the field. You don't have to worry about little uh, Allen wrenches. Uh, these slots are actually large enough that you can take a 308 case and stick the rim of the case in there and use that to loosen it up. In fact, that's what I prefer to do now because uh, the brass of the case uh, is not likely to damage the finish or start to uh, round out the screw holes. Uh, and if I have the rifle, I almost always have either fired cases or loaded cases standing by that I can use to loosen up those screws. Uh, you can you need to unscrew the screw out of here. It's a great big huge piece so if you drop it in the dirt uh, it's easy to find. The turret is actually splined onto it so it, it has gear splines uh, that it fits over. So even if the screw loosens up while you're shooting uh, you're still going to get your clicks, you're still going to get your adjustment and if it loosens up enough that that turret can start slipping off, you're gonna notice it very quickly. Uh, that is really a great bulletproof way to get your turrets locked down, get them slipped back to zero, and make sure that you don't have them come loose while you're shooting. Uh, the other common method that we see is the use of set screws around the uh, turret, either three or four set screws around it and then it will be a smooth uh, center stem. So you will loosen up those screws and then you don't have to lift the, the turret up, you can just turn it and it won't click, it'll just slip back to zero, hence the name slipping the turrets. Uh, it'll slip back to zero and then you tighten those screws back down and it's just the tension of those screws against the center stem that holds the turret in place. Now. That is a really simple, really easy way uh, to get the turret slipped back to zero, and that allows rifle scope manufacturers to be a little bit sloppier with their turret machining, their outer turrets versus the inner stem, 
because they don't have to make sure that no matter where you slip it, that your tick mark on your housing lines up with a tick mark on the turret. Uh, very often on cheap scopes that use this center screw type design, uh, you'll get them off a little bit and your marks won't line up. You'll end up with a tick mark or the uh, index mark between two tick marks. Uh, sometimes more expensive scopes uh, will do that. Uh, we have a Bushnell um, 6 to 24. It's one of the uh, Elite 3200s that has that. Uh, it will occasionally, on certain zeros, will line up between two tick marks. Um, since that's half a tenth of a mil, it's really not a game changer, but it's annoying if you're a detail-oriented person. So being able to slip the turrets with the set screws avoids that. Uh, but what you can run into is if you tighten those screws down hard enough that you know they're not going anywhere, sometimes they can deform that inner brass stem. It's usually just made of brass. And then if you have to make, say, a tenth of a mil zero change, uh, then when you slip that turret and then try to tighten it down the next time, those screws are going to go back into that deformed space and the turret will creep back to that previous zero. Um, I had that happen on a Falcon Menace scope that had pointed screws, and they would actually create little divots uh, in the brass stem if you tighten them down too much, and they would allow the turret to slide. It would be really difficult uh, to get that turret re-zeroed and slipped uh, one-tenth of a mil. If you had to go like three-tenths or four-tenths, you moved it far enough away uh, from that indent that it wasn't a problem. But if you weren't moving it that far, then it stayed right on top of that, and it could cause an issue. Uh, the bigger problem that you run into is with regular flat set screws on a flat, or uh, I'm sorry, a round stem, then if you don't get those really cranked down well, uh, then you can run into a situation where the turret just slips on you. And in the K624i review, we talked about this. Uh, I was worried about damaging the turret stem, so I probably didn't crank it down as much as I should have. Uh, and that was what I found out talking uh, to HPS later on, that I, I probably should have just cranked it down and not worried about it. But because I didn't crank those adjustment screws down or those set screws down tight enough, while I was shooting a match, I was shooting a dialing stage where I had to really quickly rip that turret into the next position. Uh, I all of a sudden had one where I grabbed it and turned it and the turret slipped. And uh, once it slips, it, you're going to have problems. Uh, some scopes that have a separate zero stop, you can run it back to the zero stop and know that you were uh, one mil below zero on your zero stop, and then you can get the turret re-indexed. You can tighten it back up, and you're good to go. Uh, on scopes like the K624i, where the clicking mechanism and the zero stop and everything was in the turret cap, uh, that's not possible. Once the turret slips, uh, you've totally lost any index that you had. Uh, so there's no real way for you to go back to zero without shooting a zero. Uh, so that's kind of a pain in the butt. So I tend to shy away from scopes that have those kind of uh, set screw adjustments, if at all possible. Uh, sometimes you really don't have the option. And sometimes you just need to man up and you need to tighten them down. And if damage comes to those stems, then try to send it back and get it fixed under warranty. Uh, the other type of adjustment I've seen is kind of a, an intermediate between the two. And U.S. Optics uses this uh, where they will use a center cap and they'll have a screw going through the center cap and there will be an O-ring underneath the cap. So you can loosen that screw, make sure the O-ring's not sticking, make sure everything is loose, and then you can slip your turret to zero and then tighten that center screw down, and it will push the cap down into the O-ring, and it will tighten everything down against the clicking mechanism and against the adjustment stem. Uh, for the E-Rex, uh, they will have two screws in the top turret. Since it's a really big round uh, turret, they'll have two screws that will set that down. And 
I really haven't had any problems with uh, EREC or the corresponding windage knob slipping. Uh, since those screws aren't bearing against a stem, I will usually put quite a bit of force down on them to compress that O-ring, uh, both to make sure that the whole system stays watertight, uh, but also to make sure that I don't have any slippage at all. And so far that's worked really well, so I don't have any problems with that setup. I do like setups like that where you don't have to actually remove anything. You don't have to take anything out of the scope uh, so there's nothing to get lost. There's nothing to blow away in the wind. Uh, disadvantage again is you come back to having to have Allen wrenches and in the case of the US Optics you actually have to have two different size Allen wrenches. One for the windage and then one for the E-Rec. Uh, so you know I, I would prefer toolless adjustments um, I like the Bushnell adjustments for slipping the turrets, but um, the Bushnell kind of negates that because you need to have two separate tools uh, to actually set the zero stops, and uh, that's, that's really a pain in the butt for me. Uh, the easiest that I've seen is on the Weaver 3 to 15 power scope. Uh, it just has a really knurled outside cap. So if you picture this kind of cap with knurling around the outside and nothing in the middle, uh, you can just adjust that with your fingers. There's no uh, tools required. Just spin that cap off, slip your turrets back to zero, uh, screw it back in and tighten it down. Now, of course, that scope, it has locking turrets, but it does not have a zero stop. Uh, so that may be an issue. Um, so those are some things to look forward to on turrets or some features to look for. Uh, as far as colors, etc., you know, really, it doesn't matter to me. This one happens to be a weird uh, tan color, uh, which actually appears to be fairly hard to get. Um, black is fine because if I need it to be another color, I'll spray it with paint. Uh, so that is what it is. Uh, now the last thing, let's talk about reticle design. Uh, reticle design is really kind of a critical thing for me because while I like turret feel, I like to have all the goodies on the turrets, um, a lot of the time I'm just holding with the reticle. So once I get the scope zeroed in, once I get the turrets locked down, uh, once all that stuff is done, uh, unless there is a specific reason why I need to dial for a stage, I'm just holding with the reticle. And for that reason, I like reticles that when you come down on the lower portion of the vertical line, I like to have index marks that go out to the sides. I call it the Christmas tree. Uh, those little marks that come out to the sides allow me to hold for both elevation and windage at the same time and be fairly precise with the measurements. I'm not holding out into a big blank spot. If I have to hold between those marks, I still have uh, graduations marked on the reticle uh, that I can use to reference, and it's a whole lot easier to do uh, than just if you have a standard like mill dot reticle and you're holding out in a dead space. So I really like to look for the Christmas tree. Um, I prefer mill reticles with mill turrets um, there are a greater variety of options out there for mill reticles, uh, mill turrets, mill mill scopes, if you will, uh, than there are for MOA, minute angle scopes. Um, regardless of which you choose, because again, this comes back to a personal preference, both are fully functional, both are uh, totally serviceable. But if you choose to use a minute angle reticle, you need minute angle turrets. If you choose minute angle turrets, you need a minute angle reticle. Um, you need to have the turrets and the reticle married to each other. Uh, don't try to go with the old school mix stuff where you have a mill dot reticle and MOA turrets unless you absolutely have to. If that's all your budget allows, uh, then that's fine. If uh, Grandpa gave you an old loophole Mark IV that's set up that way, uh, that's fine, roll with it. Uh, it is usable, uh, but if you are selecting a scope specifically for precision rifle shooting or precision rifle competition, go with matched reticle and matched turrets. I usually suggest mill reticle and mill turrets because you will find more shooters on the line with mill reticle and mill turrets. You'll find more spotting scopes with mill reticles in them uh, than you will with MOA. Um, but I'm not really biased beyond that. If you hand me an MOA reticle with MOA turrets, uh, it's going to take me a little bit to switch over my dope tables, uh, but then I'm going to be able to use it uh, fairly well. 
with the exception of having to recalibrate my brain for win holds. Uh, so make sure those match. But as far as the actual construction of the reticle, I would suggest looking for the Christmas tree. I would suggest staying away from the old school mill dots. We're finding that mill dots are really too coarse and they don't give you enough information in the rifle scope. Um, the actual dots themselves are usually either two tenths of a mil in diameter or uh, even as much as a full quarter mil in diameter, 0.25 mils in diameter. Um, that takes up a lot of space in your reticle. Uh, it can block out a lot of stuff. And usually there are no markings in the middle of those. So you have to eyeball where the middle of that mill is. Um, it's much better to go with one of the hash mark uh, gradiated reticles. Uh, and I even prefer to actually have numbers marking uh, where each one of those uh, hash marks is. I find it's just quicker to get on it uh, if you're holding for greater distances than it is to have to count the hashes. I also like to make sure that the hash marks are different sizes for the different measurements. The actual full mil hash mark should be larger than the quarter or half mil hash marks. Uh, a lot of scopes now, they will, they'll do the large uh, full mil hash marks and then smaller half mil hash marks and then everything else will be two tenths of a mil. Uh, they'll have a smaller line for two tenths of a mil in there and that seems to work really fine. Um, you want to stay away from having some mixed markings. Uh, Horus has done that in a couple of their reticles where there will be a hash at two tenths and then there will be a hash at three tenths and then another hash at two tenths and another hash at three tenths. Uh, and that will make up you know, your full mill and it, it can get confusing uh, when you're trying to figure out which is the two tenths and which is the three tenths and you're trying to do it fast. Uh, remember, all this stuff is on time. Uh, so I, I tend to shy away from those, but I can make it work if I need to make it work as long as I practice with the reticle and I know that's what's going on. Be careful when reticles start throwing all these extra scales and stuff in there. They're really not needed and they're really distracting. They can start getting in the way of getting the job done. And finally, uh, I like to make sure the upper portion of the vertical hash mark uh, is, or the upper portion of the vertical stadia line actually has hash marks on it. I don't like reticles that the markings stop at the center and you don't have any markings that go up. Uh, the reason for this is that if I run into a situation where I want to dial for a far target and I want to hold for a close target, uh, say for instance, I have a mover at 500 yards uh, and I have a steel plate at 200 yards that I need to shoot. And I need to go back and forth and alternate between the two. Um, I'm going to want to dial for my mover so that I've got that big, bold, horizontal stadia line uh, to get my leads on. And then I'm going to want to drop down and hold under to shoot that 200 yard target. And so I want those marks on the top half of the reticle, at least for a mil or two, uh, to be able to give me a reference off of. I don't want anything to stop at that point. Uh, and finally, the center of the reticle, uh, where the crosshairs actually come together. This is a massive personal preference. Uh, I have been using the Horse H59 quite a bit here lately, and so I like the center dot with a little bit of a gap around it. I think for, especially for shooting groups, uh, I can use that to shoot really precisely uh, for cold bore shots or for uh, some of the stages where uh, BNT Industries will put their little uh, Ace of Spades out and you have to do a cold bore shot on the Ace of Spades. Uh, that reticle, I think, really helps me out. Uh, some people don't like that. Some people prefer an open center. Uh, where you have a very, very small open center. And that's what I would recommend on that. If you want an open center reticle, uh, it needs to be very, very small open center. Uh, if you get too much gap in there, you lose a lot of precision with that reticle. Uh, and some people absolutely hate open centers. They don't want any openings at all in the middle of the reticle. They want a solid center crosshair. Uh, so that is going to be a lot of personal preference. Any of those work just fine. Uh, you just don't want a big, huge gap uh, between the center of your crosshairs. Um, the last feature I think that we haven't touched on yet is the ocular focus here, the diopter setting uh, on your scope. 
Most scopes now have what they call a European style or a fast focus diopter. Uh, it means there's nothing to lock this down, you just simply turn it. And what this portion of the scope adjusts is it adjusts the focus of the reticle to your eyeball. Uh, that is the only thing it's used for. Uh, usually the best way to do this is to dial your parallax to infinity, uh, point your scope up at a bright clear sky, not at the sun, just at the clear sky or at a totally flat white background. And then you will make adjustments on the diopter until the reticle is perfectly clear to your eye. Now don't just sit there and turn the diopter until you think it's clear. Uh, you want to take quick glances into the scope, make an adjustment, quick glance into the scope, uh, because otherwise your eye will focus to the reticle on its own, and that will cause eye strain during extended times looking through the scope. Uh, so do those quick peaks uh, and get that dialed in. Uh, I'm not a great big huge fan of the fast focus diopters. I really prefer diopters that have a locking ring. Once I get this diopter set for me, I don't really want it to move anywhere. So I would prefer to have a locking ring that I screw down and lock it down. And then I can put my scope cap on here and I don't have to worry about it moving. Uh, now, what I will do very often on some scopes is once I get the diopter setting, I will take uh, riggers tape or electrical tape and I'll make a couple of turns around it uh, so that it holds that in place and then drop my scope cap on there. And so my scope cap doesn't really want to turn the diopter setting uh, if it gets bumped. Because once you get that big, huge scope cap on there, it makes it really easy to bump it and spin the diopter off. Uh, another good idea is to take a magic marker, a Sharpie, something, and make an index mark once you get it dialed in. Uh, that way, if it gets bumped off one way or the other, it's really quick to dial it back on. So if I have the option, if I'm custom building a scope, then I'm gonna put a locking ring on that diopter. Um, if not, almost everything now has the fast focus or European diopter, so you're pretty much stuck uh, with what the scope manufacturer comes up with. Uh, that, well, let's talk about sunshades real quick since we have a sunshade on this optic. Uh, sunshades are absolutely not a necessity. Uh, in fact, I rarely am using a sunshade for what you would normally think it's used for. Uh, sunshades are to keep that glare off your objective lens. Uh, it helps a little bit in concealment because you're not going to get shine off of it, but in precision rifle competition, we don't care about concealment. Guys are running bright orange rifles and they're running NASCAR jerseys anyway, uh, so it's not a big deal as far as trying to conceal yourself, conceal your position. Um, and what it does though is it keeps a little bit of that glare off that objective lens and gives you a cleaner sight picture. If you get glare on the objective, uh, it's going to really give you a nasty milky sight picture. So that is one option. But when we start getting into the top end rifle scopes, they've done such a good job with designing this objective on here and such a good job with the coatings on it, unless the sun is really low in the sky you don't have a whole lot of problems uh, with glare off the scope. What I really like the sunshade for is when you're shooting in the rain. Uh, when you're shooting in the rain, this helps keep a whole lot more spray and a whole lot more water off your objective lens. Uh, it really has to come in at a hard angle. It has to really be blowing straight in off the rifle in order for me to get rain on the objective lens. So if you have the opportunity for a sunshade, uh, if a sunshade comes with the scope like it did with the XRS, uh, then it's a nice thing to have. You don't have to always run it, throw it in your pack. Uh, in fact, I will only run them when I need to run them. I don't generally just leave them on for competitions because you are extending the scope and these are fairly fine threads here. So if you take a really hard hit on this thing, uh, it's going to damage the sunshade. It's going to damage your scope. It may really cause catastrophic damage to it and take you out of the running. Uh, so I don't run them on here if I don't need them. But for rain or when that sun is really low in the sky, a sunshade is a nice thing to have. Now, it's not a make it or break it kind of thing because uh, you can get some cardboard or whatever you have laying around and some riggers tape and you can make a sunshade really quick out of stuff you find laying around. Uh, so if your scope doesn't offer a sunshade but it hits the check boxes on everything else you want, 
Don't worry about it. Figure out how to rig something up when you need it. That's about it for features that I look for in precision rifle scopes. I hope you guys have liked this video. If you have, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you have any questions on anything I covered in the video or anything else, please leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. And as always, until next time, get out and shoot!